Well, this morning we start our summer sermon series on the Psalms. And I love the Psalms. And the more I know about the Psalms, the more I know that I don't know. And so I decided that it would be good for us to have an expert on the Psalms this morning, Father Terry, who was a part of our staff. He was on our staff for 15 years, as a matter of fact. He is the priest at the Charismatic Episcopal Church of the Resurrection in Bel Air. They are on the north side of 37th Street between Oliver and Woodlawn. And their services are at 5 p.m. He has a hard time getting out of bed, so that's why he set the service at 5 p.m. Just kidding. No, it's a good time, so you're always welcome. Everybody is welcome, right? So it's a blessing to have you here this morning. And from now until Labor Day, every week I'm going to preach on a different psalm. So we really need you to help us understand what it is that we're getting into. But before we do that, I was with Father Terry in New York City for a conference. And because he is a charismatic Episcopalian, that means that you never know what you're going to get in for. Because he's open to the Holy Spirit, and sometimes you just go along for the ride. So in New York City, we find a restaurant that, this is in Manhattan, that didn't cost an arm and a leg, and the food was good, and it was reasonably priced. But we discovered the real reason why God led us there, and it was because of this server, Nikita. Now, share with the congregation, in a nutshell, what happened with Nikita. Well, we actually went to this restaurant two, two evenings in a row because it was a good, good place to go. And so the first night we had Nikita, and that night we got to talking to her. And, you know, your pastor has never met a stranger in his life. You know this about him. I mean, and so, um, you know, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the intro, I'm the introvert here, and he is extrovert over the top. And anyway, so we get to talking to her, and... She finds out that we're pastors, and and so then we go to the second night. Well, in the process, she started sharing her story with us, and she had two tattoos, one on each wrist. Um, it was faith and hope, wasn't it? Hope and faith. And uh, and her grandmother, I told her uh, always to keep hope and faith alive in her life. And uh, she'd come from Florida, and so one thing leads to another. And we anointed her with oil, and I anointed her wrists, and we prayed for her. And so, what else do you want me to say? It was a good time. It was beautiful it was, it because was, this was the other a. The servers then said, "Well, we want him to pray for us." <laughs> <laughs> and this place was loud. With it was a bar grill place, and it was just incredible. Anyway, she put out her wrists, and you anointed her wrists because we wanted God to increase her hope and increase her faith, which yep. was her request beautiful experience. So I appreciate you and I'm grateful for the gift of your friendship. When I was at Friends University in 1992, it was the fall and I was sitting there waiting for this seminar to begin and all of a sudden he walks by and I did not know him from Adam and God impressed upon me that he and I would become friends but it didn't happen that day. In fact, it was almost two years later Mm -hmm. when we intersected at a retreat experience and from that point... Uh, we have developed a friendship, and again, I am very, very grateful for you and for your ministry. So, yeah, likewise, tell likewise. us, why is it that you are so passionate about the Psalms? What is it about the Psalms that you find meaningful and helpful and hopeful? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> but where it all started was Julie, my wife, she's supposed to be here in this service, but I don't see her. Um, Anyway, oh, there she is. Okay. Um, <laughs> I got to make sure I know where she is or I'll get in trouble later, you know. And, uh, and he says stuff and I get in trouble then because of that. And, and for those of you who've been around, you remember the ticket issue, don't you? The, when I got the speeding ticket, your wife's well, not now here. Now you're telling a part of it, you have to tell the whole of it. No, I, we'll go on. We were living in Belgium and working with university students at, at a, through a Christian mission. And I was studying philosophy at the same time, and we lived in a in a uh, flat in a on the third story 
in a, in a small apartment, but had a large picture window, and it looked out over a botanical garden. Now, Jan, you're going to have to forgive me on this, okay? I just, um, okay. So, um, anyway, this botanical garden was beautiful, and we would walk through this botanical garden every day. And, um, but I began to reflect on it. The Lord kind of used it in my life. And at the same time, I was young and idealistic, a lot younger than I am today, and I was going to read everything back in those days, you know, just everything there was, I was going to read it, and so I was in the process of reading everything that Dietrich Bonhoeffer had written, and I read his little book on the Psalms, prayer book of the Bible, and he also talks about praying the Psalms in his book Life Together, and so I began to pray the Psalms uh, during our time there in Belgium, and I didn't know then, I was pretty naive about everything, and I didn't know that people have been praying the Psalms for 2,000 years or more, and, um, and they had already, you know, I took out my calculator and divided them all up to try to figure out how many I had to read in order to read them all through a week, and how many then I would do through a month, and all that had already been done much better than I could ever dream of doing, um, so but I didn't know that. a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I did, and so, but I would find out about that later. But one of the things that I began to realize is that um, there is a, a, a tendency within us, I think, to make our lives like a botanical garden. And when you think of botanica, um, nothing ever dies. The moment it begins to droop, they pull it out and put in something fresh, right? Um, and, and it's always in season. And in this case... It's always beautiful. It's always beautiful, always immaculately kept. And, uh, uh, and, the, and, 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 and in this case, everything was named. You know, you had the Latin name, you had the English name, and you had the Flemish name. Um, and, uh, and so everything is named. And, and sometimes I think that we try to make our Christian lives that way. We try to tidy them up, keep them circumspect and... Make sure everybody thinks we're doing the right thing, you know. We want and it to look beautiful even we, if we don't feel it. Even if we don't feel it, and uh, we like to f think we've got everything categorized and named, and, and we've got control of things. But I find that life isn't that way. Life is much more like a wilderness. I love the Rocky Mountains. We're going again to the Rockies in the end of July, and I don't get on Facebook much, but I always put our couple of pictures from the Rockies on, on, on Facebook. But... Uh, the wilderness territory has a certain kind of design about it and has a certain kind of order, but it also has death and decay right in the midst of it all, okay? And nothing is named. All you know is that's beautiful. That's really gorgeous. I have to get a book and figure out what that is, you know, and see if I can, you know, and maybe I know a few things, paintbrush and, you know, a couple of, you know, wildflowers, but most of it, it's just, it's just great, you know, but you can't name it, you can't identify it, it's, it's kind of a mystery. And that's more what life is like. I mean, there's a certain design, there's a certain order, but, but, but there's, a lot of, there's a lot of lousy things that happen in life. There's a lot of death, and a lot of decay, and a lot of sorrow and hurt. And it's messy. It's messy, and there's a lot of mystery about the mess as well. And so I find the Psalms are much more like that wilderness than like Botanica. Right in the middle, you can be reading a beautiful Psalm. Psalm 139 is one of my favorites to, to, to talk about this. You know, it's, the Lord knows my getting up and my lying down. He knows everything about me, whether I go down to Sheol, I mean, he's with me there. You know, it doesn't matter. And for 17 verses, it's glorious. And then the psalmist ruins it. I mean, he ruins the Psalm. Because he starts talking about the enemies and, you know, God, you need to smash them and all this stuff. And, and so he just ruins the song. But in reality, that's life. That's more life than Botanica. Yeah. And so all of that began back in those days. And so for the last 35 years, whatever it is, you do the math, 79, pretty much, I mean, I can't say every day because I'm not that consistent, but... Pretty, every month, I read through the Psalms. I pray through the Psalms. And it's very unspiritual. I do it out loud. And, and I do it according to this thing, um, this little pamphlet. 
which we want to invite people to take out right now, okay. is this was written by Father Terry, which, by the way, he has his PhD from <coughs> pardon me, Durham University in the UK. And so he speaks with authority, and I hope that we will respect that. This pamphlet was written by him, and you will see that there is a guide there. We're inviting you to take this and to use it as you enter into the Psalms. Now, let me ask you this. The Psalms show up in Jesus' teachings, in Jesus' own experience. Tell us about that. Well, and I don't remember off the top of my head, and I don't have it in my notes here, but the Psalms are quoted like 430 some odd times in the New Testament, okay? It's the most quoted book next to Second Isaiah in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament. And Jesus is often referring to the Psalms, but it's always been very moving to me and very fascinating that when Jesus is on the cross, he doesn't, he doesn't use his own words. He uses the words of the Psalms. And so, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says on the cross, Psalm 20, 22, 1. And then when he says, into your, uh, his last words, into your hands I commend my spirit. I think that's Psalm 37 or 35 or 31, I don't know what it is. But anyway, he, he would have known the Psalms as a young boy. He would have prayed the Psalms on a daily basis as a young Jewish boy. And probably when he was bar mitzvah at 12, he would have known the majority of the Psalms by heart. So... And Seriously, all 150? And it was not uncommon for the early Christians to know all 150, okay? Um, we have many, I, I mean, I, could, I can document this and talk about it and show it, but, um, but the early Christians loved the Psalter, and, and St. Paul alludes to that whenever he says, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody in the Lord, to the Lord, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms. Now, why is he talking about singing psalms? What's the value of that? The psalms really probably were more to be chanted and sung rather than read, okay? Um, first of all, we... We started, losing the, we started losing the rhythm of the psalms when we started praying them silently or reading them silently. That, that, nobody did that until the, until the printing press was invented 400, 500 years ago. Okay? And since then, we've started losing our memory and we also have lost how to, how, so how to, read, for, how to pray the psalms. For a long time, how were the psalms? They would have been prayed out loud. All of Scripture would have been read out loud. I mean, how do you think the Ethiopian eunuch Philip, whenever he meets the Ethiopian eunuch, and he says, you know, he hears him reading Psalm Isaiah 53 in Acts 8. And, you know, so everything was done out loud. So I would encourage you, and I don't, my students always say, well, Father Terry, why do you want us to do that? I don't know exactly why, but I know from experience that to read them out loud, to murmur them, to mumble them, that's the word that we get our word meditate, Hagah, the Hebrew word. Um, is to mutter or to, to, to kind of grumble them, to, to say them out loud. It does something in your soul that, that doing them silently will not do. Mm -hmm. And I know we've got family members and you maybe feel awkward, you know, because they're overhearing you or something. And, but just, and, it, and, and I always do both morning and evening at the same time. I, I find that I don't get back to the evening if I don't do them of a morning. Um, or sometime during the day. And, so, and it only takes about 15 minutes to do... To do to, and, and you'll pray through this altar in a month, in 30 days. And, and the amazing thing for me is that I've been doing this for 35 years and they're not boring. Now, I don't know about you, but I've lived long enough to know that there's a lot of things that you can do for 35 years and you get really bored with, okay? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and so that's, that's a miracle to me. Yeah. So that's as an amazing we're, thing. As me. we're reading the Psalms out loud or singing them, and I find that singing them is a great way to memorize them. If you have a hard time memorizing, start singing the words, and before you know it, you will have memorized it. 
But what are the major themes that emerge out of the Psalms? Well, scholars debate that, of course, and, and, but I think there are really, really solid arguments. Part of the reason is, is the Psalms, we have the Psalms for a thousand years. We have different authors of the Psalms. Our oldest Psalm is probably from Psalm 29 from 1400 BCE. And then our youngest Psalms are second century, maybe, and um, BC. And so you got a thousand years and you got many authors. And so they debate whether there can be a theme, you know, that holds them together. But I think the theme that does hold them together is that God rules or God reigns. What does that mean? That means that God can be trusted. And the psalmist, in everything that the psalmist does, whether he's complaining, whether he's griping, whether he's asking God to knock their teeth out, whether he's rejoicing and exalting in all that God has done or all that God is, all the highs and the lows and everything in between, the psalmist does one thing. He trusts God. He chooses to trust God in the face of the worst case scenarios that can ever happen. He knows the, the Psalms know the depths of the depths of our human experience. And the psalmist reminds us that God can be trusted because God rules. And at the end of the day, God wins. I mean, we said it in the song, you know. We said it in the song that, that, that death does not have the last word. God does. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> many people think David wrote many of the psalms. What is your opinion about that? That David wrote some of the psalms, I think there's no question. Now, 73 psalms are uh, attributed to David, but the phrase in, in the original La David is, is a, a, a phrase that's ambiguous. And so it can, it, it, there's not a solid way to translate it. It can be in the name of David or on behalf of David or in the spirit of David or in other ways as well. So just because it says a psalm of David doesn't necessarily mean that David wrote it. And in some cases, we know that David didn't write it because there's a historical allusion to something that happened 500 years after David lived. And so now, just to settle your nerves on this, uh, I'm a firm believer that David did write Psalm 23. So there. Okay. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. So don't so, worry about that one. <laughs> so tell us about the different books of the Psalms and how this, this whole book is structured, not only in terms of organization, but themes. The, the Psalms grow, obviously, because we, we begin collecting. T David and Solomon, you know, when you read Chronicles and you read kings and you read Samuel you know the, the, you we know that that they had a lot to do with 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 the psalmic and proverbial proverbial traditions and so um, but that continued after uh, after their rule and so you have collections being brought together and it continues to grow and so what we have in the canon of the 150 probably doesn't take its full shape until maybe the second century BCE or something like that. And so, um, so at, but at the end of each one of these, what we call books of the Psalms. Yeah, how did they decide, okay, we're starting a new book at Psalm 42? Well, the only, the, the editors did it, but the way we know it is because at the end of each of these books, the end of 41, at the end of 72, 89, etc., there is a doxology or a word of praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. That's at the end of 41. And so that's a kind of bringing to conclusion that book of, of Psalms. Now, again, I don't have time to talk about, tr to treat this with fairness, but there is a way that, except for Psalms 1 and 2, which if we have time we want to get to, except because 1 and 2 introduce us to the Psalms. They're like, they're like two large doors that open up and introduce you into this large country of the Psalms. And, but all of the Psalms... Psalm 3 to 41 technically are Psalms of David. They're all, they're all um, 9 and 10 should go together uh, because of the manuscript tradition that we know about. 9 and 10 shouldn't be separated. They should go together. And the same with 30, whatever it is, 35, I don't remember. 
off the top of my head. And but anyway, that doesn't matter. In Psalm 1 and 2, you say go together too. But there is a... There's, there's an introduction. A, and then an let me read 70. Here. Let me read 70, uh, the end of 72. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be His glorious name forever. May His glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. Prayers of David, son of Jesse, are ended. They all have that doxology at the end. Right. Now, we have other prayers of David. (laughs) Okay, later. So, that obviously was an end at one point to the prayers of David. But then we get more prayers of David. Okay? Uh, Like 140, 138 or whatever. But we have other of David psalms. Be, besides those in, seven, in, in 1 to 72. So teach us about the types of psalms. There are hymns of praise, and I like just to simplify. I know that most people don't think I simplify anything, but um, hymns of praise are, we, we praise God for who He is, okay? And we thank God for what He's done. So the Psalms of Thanksgiving are about how God has delivered me, how God has healed me, how God has forgiven me, how God has redeemed me. Um, uh, the hymns of praise are for who He is. He's my shepherd. He's my rock. He's my redeemer. He's the one in whom I can trust and, and put my confidence in. And then there are the Psalms of Lament. And there are more Psalms of Lament. And this, I what also, is a Psalm of Lament? Um, I have to be careful with my language here because my wife's here. Um, the Psalm of Lament says how bad didn't do it did i bad life is okay how horrible things have gotten and he's crying out that god will somehow deliver him out of the situation that he finds himself in and there's a flow there's a literary flow in the psalm of lament that's pretty consistent and so we 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 know that but what is the psalmist doing? What is he naming? He's naming his hurt. He's naming his loss. He's naming his disappointment. He's naming his, his anger. He's naming um, how he has been uh, abused, how he's been taken advantage of. He's, he's naming, uh, feeling as though he's, he's been abandoned by God, the mm-hmm. eclipse of God. Yeah. Um, and, and so he's not afraid to pray his pain. Why are we so afraid to pray our pain? Because we want botanica. We want it all to be nice and neat now, and put together. here. Did you hear that? See? Why are we f- afraid to pray our pain? Because? We want everything to be beautiful. We want everything. We don't. And it, and, it, and it angers us and it hurts us when hard things happen to people that we love, to ourselves, to others. And, and, and God wants, God knows that's happening. And so God wants us to lay it at his feet. That what the psalmist does is he prays his anger so that he doesn't take his anger out on his enemies. Because no psalm, not one psalm, does the psalmist say, I will knock their teeth out, Lord. Just give me the okay. okay? He never says that. He always says, you act on my behalf. Well, and he Bring is, justice. He's Bring very justice. specific yes. in his asking because there's that one psalm is it 37? Where 137. 137, he's asking God to take the enemy's children and take their heads and smash them against a rock and watch their brains run out on the rock. Now, that's pretty graphic. Very graphic. And the only response I have to say to that is that that's exactly what the Babylonians had done to the children of Israel. That's a, that's a psalm. Whenever you look at the psalm, it says, how can we sing the songs of, of Zion... On, on, you know, in Babylon, how can we, how can we celebrate who we were in light of our, in, in light of the fact that they have come and conquered us and now taken us in captivity and we're now their slaves, and now, especially in, spi- in light of their pain. In light of their pain. Now, none of us here, in all likelihood, we I mean we have some some serious pain. I'm not wanting to make light of that, but in terms of certain parts of the world. A lot of good work is being done in Africa, for example, where there is so much violence and there has been so much um, hatred and, and, and apartheid and, and just, you know, annihilation of, of, of whole people groups. And 
the, the, people are using the Psalms and working theologically with the Psalms to work through how do we get to forgiveness in this. So let and me so ask. So really, it's very powerful. So in terms of the psalmist praying that the children's heads be smashed into the rock, why do the psalms repeatedly teach us to pray our feelings? What's the benefit when it comes to these violent psalms? I think the best I can do, I mean, I've got a list of things and you can read stuff and it's all real wonderful and good, but we have to pray who we are and not who we think we should be. We've got to start where we are. If I'm angry and hurt, if I feel abandoned and lost, I've got, got to start there. I can't, I can't start with my prayers in some other place. Okay? And God wouldn't want me to. God knows me. No secrets are hid. You know, I say at the beginning of every liturgy, you know, to you all hearts are open. No secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you. And that's always a scary phrase to me, okay? But God knows our hearts. So we, so we begin where we are and not where we think we ought to be. We know what Jesus taught right. us about forgiveness. And St. Paul, I mean, bless those who persecute. Bless, do not curse them. We know these, we know that. But I've got to pray myself to be able to bless you know, so when the psalmist is praying that God will take their heads and smash them against the stone, by virtue of that prayer, what is he asking God to do? He's asking God to take care of the, of, of the reality of the injustices that have occurred because he's not going to do it. Because if it were left up to him, he'd smash he would do, their heads. He would smash the heads. Let me read Psalm 3 real quickly. I know we're out of time, but... Now listen to this. Just listen to the... This is the first prayer of the Psalms, okay? Psalm 3. Because 1 and 2 get us ready for prayer, and unfortunately we're not going to get to those. O oh Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. My glory the one who lifts my head. I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. When are you more vulnerable? My foes are all around me, and now I'm going to take a nap? That's trust. That's the psalmist trusting his God. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. 10,000. Rise up, O Lord. Deliver me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Okay? You do it. I could do it. But I'm trusting you. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. Now, psalm after psalm after psalm teaches us that same thing. And what is that one thing that gets repeated over and over that is the good news for us to take home today? That God can be trusted. And that's what the psalms train us to do. When the life is at its darkest, if I'm praying the psalms, I realize that, that God can be trusted and I have had seasons of very deep darkness. And some of you know enough of my story to know some of those times. But, and it was the Psalms that sustained me. And, and, and I still, I mean, it's like I said at the beginning, you know, I just don't know how I would not just put out with them, you know, kind of. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've tried, I've, I do other disciplines as well, but this is my bread and butter. This is what I do this is the heart and soul of me, of, of who I am. And all I can say, I've got 35 years of experience with it, and it works. It's all I know. Mm -hmm. It works. So as we wrap up here, we're inviting people to take their sheet and start reading the Psalms out loud. Right. And do you ever journal what bubbles up? Yeah, I do. Um, some. I'm not a big journaler but I do some, 
Um, and I don't do it in fancy little books because I don't want anyone to find it later. Um, and so um, I do it kind of quietly and on my own. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we, when, you know, two years ago when it was, you know, it was, it was, it was in the praying of the Psalms in, a, in February of 213 when I realized that things, God spoke to me and said, things are going to change at Chapel Hill, but it'll be all right. You trust me. I've got a plan for you. And, and, it, and it happened over a week, a whole week period. And I didn't say anything to you. I didn't say anything to, to Jewel at that point. You know, everything else would kind of unfold for another three or four weeks before I mentioned it to you and her. And lo and behold, you know, we entered into that. And but God spoke to me, and it was through through my daily devotions in the Psalms and other ways, and and uh, and I journaled that period that season. One other quick question. Selah, S E L A H. You will often see that in yeah. the Psalms. What's that about? Best thing that we can say is, first of all, nobody really knows what that means. Okay, you just have to admit that. Everybody, some people think they know. And they act like they know, but no, but we don't. Linguistically, we don't. It's kind of like a Shagayan. What's a Shagayan? We don't know, okay? We got our guesses, but we... Sila means pause. It's the best we can come up with. I once heard a Pentecostal preacher um, say that Sila is like what a cow does with its cud. It eats its grass in the morning when it's fresh and cool and green, and then as the sun gets to about midday, the cow goes over underneath the tree and belches it all back up and does it again. Okay, that's sea law. Okay, now if that's not earthy enough for you, then sorry. <laughs> We're not in the botanica, are we? <laughs> not in botanica, no more, not, not right now. Well, let's pray. God, we are Thank so you, incredibly grateful for Father Terry and for his ministry among us and for his ministry to so many throughout the world. Help us to have a desire to read the Psalms and not just to read them, but to enter into the life of them as you enter your life into us so that we can experience the beauty of the wilderness mm -hmm. and the strength of admitting and naming our weaknesses. Yes. So as we draw near to your table, we come because we're hungry and thirsty because our lives are not botanicas. Mm -hmm. And we name that because then we can experience you more abundantly. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Receive the benediction. Now go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May He bless you. May He make His face to shine upon you and give you His peace. May He be gracious unto you. And may in these days a holy passion would well up within each of us to pray the Psalms, to pray to the one who can be trusted in every situation, in every circumstance, to pray to the one who is not mad at us, but is for us. And he has demonstrated his love and grace by giving his own son up for us all, that we might be daughters and sons in his family. So go in the triune name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and rejoice in His love, in His unconditional acceptance. Go in His name. Amen. Amen. Go with the wind at your back and the sun on your face With the song in your heart and the promise of grace Go in peace and in truth and let love lead your way Go with God, go with God, go with the wind at your back and the sun on your face, with the song in your heart and the promise of grace, go in peace and in truth and let love lead your way, go with